In other courses, you may have already talked about what internal control is, but let's look at the formal definition. This definition is from the COSO Integrated Internal Control Framework, which we'll talk about later in this course. So first of all, so internal control is a process. What does that really mean? That means you don't do it, make the little check marks, shove it in a drawer and say, whoops, we're done. We've done internal control. It has got to be ongoing. Your business changes. You uh, discover that maybe your internal control isn't as effective as you would like. Therefore, you need to continually update your controls. Next, by entities, board of directors, management, and other personnel. Everybody from the very top of the organization to the lower levels have one way or another are going to affect internal control. This could be anybody, once again, from the board of directors to the person who locks the door at night. Because, yes, locking the door is a type of internal control. Designed to provide reasonable assurance. Notice this doesn't say absolute. If we try to provide absolute assurance that no fraud or mistake or other threat would happen, our business would nearly come to a stop because all we would be doing is enforcing internal controls in place. And then regarding the achievement of objectives relating to operations, reporting, and compliance. Basically, can we meet our goals in all these areas? So we have a process, all, all levels of personnel within the company, reasonable assurance, and we can meet our goals. So a lot of people think about internal controls. Hey, we have this nice binder of policies, procedures, and check marks and checklists of everything we need to do. But if there's not an integrated approach to internal control and a belief that these are still important and everybody does that, it is not, it's the same as not having that in internal control. In fact, it is a bit uh, more dangerous because people think that you have everything, all the processes in place, but if nobody's following them or really takes it seriously, it's actually worse than the fact that you know there's no control to start with. As we mentioned before, it is a reasonable assurance because to get absolute you wouldn't get anything in business done. It would be also very expensive. So it's almost impossible to achieve that anyway. So you try to find the right balance. So there we looked at the formal definition, but maybe how to break it down if you're talking to a non-business person. So internal control makes sure that the things we want to happen will happen. Many, you know, we do these things on a daily basis. A student wants to pass his or her exam. So they know it just doesn't happen without some intervention. For most of us, that means studying, review, uh, rereading the chapter, working problems, things like that. And things that we don't want to happen won't happen. So we lock our doors when we leave our house or apartment. We put on our seatbelt. So things like that. We do internal control in our own personal lives. Obviously, it's a lot uh, bigger deal with an organization. So if you think about it, it's really common sense. If you are a part of business, what do you worry about going wrong? What can you do to make sure it doesn't? Or if you can't prevent it, how can you make sure it's detected? Or how do you get your business back up and running if it is a major threat? And then how do you know things are under control? Can you monitor this and make changes if you need to? Unfortunately, internal controls do have limitations. So this could be as simple as simple errors and mistakes. A lot of internal controls rely on human. 
intervention. And yes, we still make mistakes. Now, with computer automation, some of the reviews and things can be done in a more automated manner. So it'll kick out exceptions that somebody then needs to review and go from there. Probably more dangerous than that is being overridden by management. So if you have controls in place, documented, but management say, you know what, don't worry about doing those controls. Um, only the accountants care and we just won't tell them type of attitude. Nobody's going to take them seriously. Uh, and if they try to do what they're supposed to, they're probably not going to do the best job. And the last one, internal controls can be circumvented by two or more people working together. Now, this is usually a short term solution because uh, it's difficult to have two or more employees working together long term to commit a fraud. Uh, and usually somebody either wants to get out or develops a conscience and confesses happens in many situations. But this is also a break for uh, break most internal controls. And a lot of controls rely, rely on segregation of duties. And this is how collusion helps get over that. So as we said, our objectives are sometimes at odds. We want to safeguard the assets by putting in these controls, but we also want to operate at efficient levels. So it's a balancing act. There are three main types of controls. Um, and each of these plays a different role. The best control system will use a combination of each of these. So there's first preventive controls. This helps us to make sure the problem doesn't happen. It deters a problem. And if you think about this from a fraud triangle perspective, we are taking away any opportunity. But we're not always just protecting from fraud. We can also try to protect from uh, data entry errors. So take, for example, a zip code is always supposed to be five digits. We can make sure by putting in controls that somebody who is doing data entry doesn't enter a zip code with four digits or a zip code that accidentally has a letter. So those are controls that you do not for fraud, but for data entry. Just as important are detective controls. We can't prevent everything from happening, but we want to be able to detect it as quickly as possible. A common example of this is a bank reconciliation. Doing those on a timely manner can help uh, determine one, if there was a mistake made in recording cash, or two, is there a potential fraud going on because things are not matching uh, the records to the bank uh, detail or the bank's uh, statement. So we're trying to discover problems. And the reason that's important is some of the larger crimes that have been committed for fraud have taken over a long period of time. Most fraudsters start small and rather get large towards the end. One example of this is the Rita Cronwell case in Dixon, Illinois, where she actually um, had her fraud scheme last over 20 years. Just think, even if it was caught at year five, she wouldn't have gotten away with $53 million. But since she started small, maybe only four or five million. Still a large fund, uh, sum of money, but not nearly as bad as the 53 million over 20 years. And the last control is corrective controls. These are ways to identify the cause. So what happened? Why did this error happen? Correcting it, whatever you need to do short term, and then making sure your controls are in place so it doesn't happen again. So we could take those types of controls and break them down into two categories. So the first is general controls. These are items that uh, go over the entire organization. 
So things like having good user IDs and passwords, making sure that your security to let people into the building is appropriate, uh, making sure your employees have been trained on what to do with certain uh, IT when they get a spam email, for example. So all these are making sure your control environment is stable and you have everything you're, you're able to further protect when you get to the application controls. So the application controls are more specific to a design, a specific computer application. So think about controls that are related to the accounts payable system or the purchasing system. These are more contain, you know, dealing with making sure our data is accurate in that, making sure it's processed correctly, um, having controls to make sure if we send our data somewhere else, it is being encrypted and properly maintained. So why do accountants care? So our first objective of an AIS is to really control the organization. So we are making sure that our assets are safeguarded and it's usually the accountant's jobs to make sure that is done. And this is assets from anything that's on the balance sheet. And think about it, some companies, one of their largest assets is their data or their computer algorithm. Um, and not all of this is actually on the balance sheet, but it still needs to be safeguarded. Accountants help by uh, designing the control system. If you're working in industry, you may actually help design a control system. If you're working in public accounting, you may actually audit that system to make sure that it is effective and have to report back into the annual report. So management accountants may also, if you're working in industry, be an internal auditor and need to audit. But you also need to find ways to reduce other system threats, whether it's technical controls or uh, other general controls. And you need to be able to be part of that team that helps modify and evaluate information systems. So you're involved with controls all the way around. All right, thank you for listening today and look for uh, the next videos on the control environment.